Well, welcome everyone. Nice to see you all. Uh, and uh, welcome, Jacob. And um, we're going to get this party started. Um, let me uh, pray and we'll get going. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to get together and fellowship in your name. And we ask that you would bless us and teach us through uh, the this study in 1 John. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that we still have freedom to study it. Pray you would continue to protect the many Christians around the world who actually are under a lot of persecution and things like that these days. And so I pray you'd be with Jacob and give him your word to communicate to us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Greetings to all of you, and thank you so much for joining us. It's just after 7 p.m. in the U.K. at the moment. I know others of you are, of course, in the United States on the East Coast, where it's five hours earlier on the West Coast, where it's eight hours earlier, somewhere in Israel, where it's two hours later in South Africa and so on. And a few of you real early birds are in Australia. Uh, I think everyone in New Zealand is still asleep. Nonetheless, thank you so much for joining us. You know, we get all kinds of emails and questions and we usually just answer an individual email. But when a couple of people ask a question, Sometimes it's better just to answer it for everybody. And it's something I didn't think of. But in the last two weeks, we began getting a, a very odd question. Uh, as you know, with COVID, we're doing a lot more on internet now. We're doing a lot more stuff. I'm doing three, four things a week, sometimes even more possibly, but three or four things a week at least. And some is on Moriel, some is on RTN, and some could be on some other platform or channel where it will be reposted on Moriel. So where you see it's Moriel, you will usually see a Moriel banner, or if there's no banner, you'll see a Moriel shirt, a shirt with the Moriel logo embroidered on it. Or if I'm not wearing a Moriel shirt like I'm not now, you might see a Moriel cap, <laughs> a Moriel cap. It's just the way we identify what's ours as opposed to what's being produced by somebody else, distinguished between Moriel, RTN, and, and some other platform or channel. Uh, we just do it that way so we'll know what, what's ours. Um, doesn't mean anything, it's just what we do. Um, You'll see the Morio logo if it's, if it's a Morio production, or sometimes even if it's an RTM production, also being shown on Morial. But then just do it that way. Uh, it doesn't mean anything. But some lady in America suggested I was doing it because I got my hair cut too short. Well, let me explain to the ladies in America what happens. People in the United States may not know this. In Great Britain and in the British Commonwealth countries, like even Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the uh, COVID lockdowns are much more restrictive than they are in the United States, much more. Uh, barbershops closed for weeks, a couple of months at a time. We've had two major lockdowns in Britain, and there's rumors there could even be a third one. If the India strain of COVID comes into Britain. There's a lot of people from India who live here and things like this, this rumored. But you never know what's going to happen. There's so much rumor and misinformation and disinformation on the internet and conflicting reports on the news. I, I don't know. Nobody seems to know. Even the politicians who are responsible for most of the confusion. But we've had a lot of lockdowns in Britain and they're much more stringent than they are in the United States, as they are in Canada, Australia. British Commonwealth countries are just much more rigid in enforcing the COVID lockdowns. So you, you can't get a haircut or a coffee or a hairstyle that's, that's, that, that's gone. And you wait months and a couple months ahead of a couple of months. So when they partially began to lift the COVID restrictions about 10 days ago, and they're not fully lifted yet, but when they partly released them, hoping that there will not be a third lockdown, 
But when they did, a lot of people in Britain got their hair cut shorter than normal, <laughs> than they usually would. And I was just like a lot of people. We just got our hair cut shorter than we would normally get it in case there's another lockdown, which is being rumored. And they got all this other stuff about vaccine passports and, and, and a third jab, a third inoculation, all, all this stuff. We just don't know. So <laughs> I've had it with my haircut problem. So like a lot of other people, I just said, <laughs> cut it really short just in case it happens again. And that's what happened. <laughs> but that's nothing to do with why, you know, I would wear a Moriel cap, you know. Um, I wear a Moriel cap because I'm not wearing a Moriel shirt, basically. Then we have to identify the Moriel productions cinema, cinematographically, and that's just how we do it. But I, I was surprised we had a few, it was just, it was like four people or five people asked about this. So that that's basically what, what happened, if it means anything. I don't know. It seems silly to have to explain something like that, but people were curious about it, so I explained it. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer once again. Thank you so much, Sandy. May the Lord be with us as we expound his word tonight. May his name be glorified and his people edified in these last days. In the name of Jesus, amen. We're looking again at 1 John chapter 2, and we're looking at what we might call, or some would call, the eschatological chapter, a uh, portion of the chapter of 1 John 2. That is concerning the last days, the return of Christ. I use the term, as you know, eschatology with a great deal of qualification, which we explain at every instance. We have to. I have read this in Greek yesterday. Uh, we will not need a lot of Greek today, but I have, I assure you, read it in the original language myself yesterday. Look with me, please, to 1 John chapter 2. Verse 15, we'll pick up in verse 15. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, then the love, of the, the love of the Father is not in him. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Look and pride. And boasting is not from the Father, but from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. People who are given over to boastful pride and into the look. Now, I'm not putting down being fashionable. I'm not putting down, you know, people dressing nice or ladies dressing attractively for their husband or people dressing to look professional for their for their work. I, I'm not, not talking about that. I'll tell you what, what, what we're talking about as one example. Uh, a church in New York, I'd mentioned this, where I attended as a young believer. As a young believer, I attended a major Baptist church, well-known Baptist church that had a number of prominent preachers. And Sundays, there was an 11 a.m. service normally and a 6.30 p.m. service, I believe. And they had some good Bible preachers who would come there. They had people of, of renowned authors and things like uh, Donald Hubbard and, and Alan Redpath and Stephen Olford. They, they had good people. So it was a church with some reputation to it. But Easter Sunday, they had two services because they had people who said they were Christians, who said they were evangelical Christians, who said they were born-again Christians, who'd come to church for Christmas and Easter. The reason they would come to church for Easter was for the Easter parade. It was just part of the cultural thing you did. People would stroll up and down Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, which is like Oxford Street in England, sort of, in London, sort of. And they would show up these outfits, and what, what, people would get these Easter outfits, and, you know, you, you dressed your children up in these outfits. It, it was a, they turned the day when they supposedly were commemorating the resurrection of Jesus, which was the wrong day anyway. He rose, he rose on Yamadi Shon of, of Hagmat Sot, as we've said before. They were turning the day when they commemorate the resurrection of Jesus into a fashion show. And they would come to church to, why would, <laughs> that's the world. That's the world. 
the world has its Peter Cotton tail, and it's I, I don't care about giving kids chocolate and all that stuff, but they put the emphasis on Peter Cotton tail and all that stuff, and then the fashion show, the Easter parade. And, 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 this is the world. This is the world getting into the church. It's, it's oh, how you look. <laughs> Pride, look what I'm wearing. Look what I it's like it's like the stupid Oscars. Thank God the lowest Oscar viewership was last year until this year. Last year was the all-time low 2020. In 2021, it's gone down 60% since last year. Thank God. It's the Hollywood fashion show, isn't it? People wearing hundred thousand dollar dresses, literally hundred thousand dollar dresses. What's well, the world? That's the world. Now, notice what it says here. Now, if you have a nice suit, a nice dress, I have no problem with that. You know, if your husband likes you to wear a certain thing, he thinks you look attractive, I have no problem. You know, if you, you have a nice suit, I'm good, I'm good with that. Understand what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's the pride and the lust of the eyes. Well, underneath that stuff, we are told... It's from the world and its lusts, the lusts of the world. Like the, like the Oscars, okay? The film industry is a showcase for that kind of stuff. Verse 18, children, it's the last hour and just if you heard the Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have appeared from this, we know it's the last hour. Notice how the Holy Spirit inspires John to commence, to preface, to inaugurate his caveats and his exposition on the character of Antichrist by warning Christians to love not the world. Love not the world. Now, we're looking at a lot of things right now. I have no doubt that the way that COVID, COVID inoculations are being politically manipulated for purposes of, of population control. I have no doubt that that crisis is being exploited for political purposes for people with a political agenda that's anti-democratic. I'm not saying that there's not a COVID virus. I'm not saying that inoculations have no merit. I'm just saying that it's being manipulated politically for people. It's being manipulated politically and ultimately be used for population control. All of these things. Do I have a problem with inoculations? No. Inoculations have saved the lives of unimaginable millions of people from polio in the late 50s to diphtheria in the 1940s. That stuff was wiped out by inoculations. Now, we can all debate about COVID. It hasn't had proper peer review. It hasn't had the proper testing time and all this. That, that's all true. And it's China's gift to the world. That's all true. It's, I, I agree. This is not like other inoculations and the way it's being administrated and the way it's being used. I agree with that. But inoculations are not the problem. But anything fallen man can use for evil, he will. Blockchain currencies. Things like Bitcoin, I've got no problem with those things, but we know they will ultimately be used for evil. They will help pave the way for the mark of the beast. Digital currencies are setting the stage for that. You have the things like the Great Reset and, and globalism. All of these things are setting the stage for that. The quest for a peace in the Middle East, it'll be a false peace. We know that right now the stage is being set for the Antichrist to come and broker a false peace in the Middle East. That's what's happening in the Middle East. That's what's happening in the global economy. That's what's happening in so many, so many fronts of the world we live in. This is just the reality of the times we live, prophecies being fulfilled. However, the scriptures warn us certainly about Israel. And what deception the Antichrist will perpetrate against Israel. But that's not John's main focus here. He addresses it in Revelation. 
and in his gospel, he hints at it, certainly in chapter five, but here he's primarily talking to Christians. For many years, many faithful expositors of the word of God have been warning that the ecumenical movement is setting the stage for Christendom to become incorporated or subsumed into Babylon the Great. The ecumenical movement getting in bed with the Roman church, the liberal Protestants, I fully agree with that. The seduction is aiming at the church. But here is another seduction aimed at Christians to set the stage for Antichrist. Now remember, as we always say, and have said many times, and we'll say it again tonight, in God's economy, we can say there are three kinds of people. There are Jews, there are Gentiles from the nations, and there are believers who could be either Jew or Gentile, okay? Those say that of Israel, those say that of the nations. You've got the Goy, Israel, the nation, okay? You've got the nations, and you have saved believers in Jesus from both the nation and the nations. Okay. Satan has Israel deceived. The rabbis are trying to anoint the Messiah last week. They're just being set up for the Antichrist this moment. <sighs> this very moment political crisis in Israel, this instability in the Middle East. Uh, yeah, it's setting the stage for the Antichrist. He's going to come and convince them, trust me, I can straighten it out. They're going to trust him and believe him the way they did with the Romans when Pompey came and entered the Holy of Holies. The Antichrist will do the same. I'll point you to my book, Shadows of the Beast. Well, that's reality. Well, okay, this is Israel. The nations are already deceived. In a post-Christian neo-pagan world, particularly the Western world, Satan will have no problem taking most people to the cleaners and getting them to believe the Antichrist. He'll have no problem. He'll use pretended signs and wonders. He's going to pretend to be able to bring the world back from the brink of a, a nuclear holocaust of some kind. When men say peace and safety, then the end will come. He'll bring a false peace, and he'll promise people he can restore the prosperity they once had during a time of shortages, and people will look for, look for somebody who can deliver these things other than look to Jesus. That's going to happen. Satan has the nations deceived. He has Israel deceived. He's trying to deceive us, believers, particularly faithful believers. And the way he is doing it, John warns, is to get us to love the world, to love the things of the world, the lusts of the flesh. Look at the Oscars last week. What a stupid spectacle. I In Hollywood, you're as successful as your last picture, unless you're a rare legend, a rare A-listed legend, as they refer to them. You're as successful as your last picture. Okay. Uh, success walks hand in hand with failure, as the Kinks sang in their song about Hollywood Boulevard. Well, let's understand this. When a film star is declining in popularity, when their last film or two have not done that well at the box office, or when their TV, TV series is not going to be rerun or is not going to be continued into the next year, they have a problem. And the way they try to keep their face in public or in the media is they usually jump onto a left-wing political bandwagon of some description and they get into these left-wing type causes i'm not saying all of it is but most of it is 
85% of this stuff you see coming out of Hollywood that's political, you know, and the hypocrisy of it. People who have stretch limousines and a chain of S Cadillac SUVs and private jets lecturing to the rest of us about <laughs> conservation and the hypocrisy is, is, is astounding. Um, and then to think because they live in this fantasy world that that gives them some credibility to tell other people how we should live and what we should believe. So when the system fails them or when they fail themselves, when they just stop being successful, they need to try to keep their face on the TV screen or on the internet or in the newspapers. So they jump on a political bandwagon. It's the sign of a loser. It's the sign of somebody who's in decline in Hollywood. 85% of the time, it's the sign of somebody in decline. Well, now Hollywood itself was in decline. <laughs> we have to understand that things like Netflix and Silicon Valley have largely replaced most of what was Hollywood. A lot of the smaller, medium-sized studios are being studios are being bought by China. A lot of the big studio houses are making stupid films for China, uh, for the Chinese market. You know, they, they, they would love Superman Eight and things like that. The Chinese love that stuff. Well, now China is buying these smaller studios, and they're trying to learn how to do their own Hollywood the way the people in India did. In India, have Bollywood. China is trying to make its own China wood, whatever they want to call it. It's it's a dying industry. It's it's all gone digital. It's gone to, to Silicon Valley. Hollywood's on its way out, so Hollywood gets more political. Now it's not just individual actors and actresses with, with sagging careers doing it. The whole industry's doing it. It's a pathetic nonsense. But when you looked at it, it, I didn't watch it, of course. I just watched news clips of it. I was glad to see it drop by 60% from its all-time low. <laughs> Uh, what is it? The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life. It was the lust of the world. The danger of things like that getting into the church. In some way, that helps set stage for Antichrist. That's what we're wondering about. Now, look, I, we have to be honest. The church was discredited by the word faith money preachers. If you look at, at Paul and Jan Crouch or Jimmy and Tammy Baker and these te terrible scandals we had with the televangelists or Wendy and Rory Alec in, in the UK, you saw what happened. They made born again a household joke. Satan anointed them to destroy the credibility of the church. And it was always the same. They were like the world. They wanted to be like movie stars. They wanted to look like movie stars and have the lifestyle of, of film celebrities. And that's what they did. They literally did that. They did the very thing John warns about. Now, again, we're not talking about people who are in secular businesses or industries who've done well. I always say I'd rather see the Christians have the money than the unsaved people. Just be generous to the Lord with the money. Realize we're only stewards of it, and God gives it for a reason. Uh, I'm not complaining about Christians being blessed with the Lord in their professions, their trades, their businesses. I'm not talking about that. I don't even necessarily have a problem with Christians being in the film industry. If God told them to, it's between them and the Lord. If you can be a witness for the Lord in something like Hollywood or the fashion industry or the music industry, you must be a very strong Christian, but <laughs> that's between you and the Lord. Okay. But when it gets to be a fashion show, when it gets to be a catwalk, when it gets to be a red carpet, when it gets to be the culture of celebrity getting into the church, we got a problem. An unclean spirit is on back of this stuff. And it begins to get into the church. Again, not to flog the dead horse, but let me show you something I was involved in. Let me read you this. I didn't do this, but I was involved with the people who, who did this. This is a, a release, communications release. Listen to this now. 
My office in Cannes, the Cannes Film Festival, the big European film festival. My office in Cannes, just now for the film festival. Well, if you call the Moriel office in Sapporo, Japan, somebody will answer and tell you the gospel. If you call the Moriel office in Australia, somebody will actually answer the telephone and tell you the gospel. If you call the Moriel office in New Zealand, somebody will answer. South Africa, somebody will answer. You call the Moriel office in Israel, somebody will answer. I'm not against ministries having branches in different countries. We do. We have branches. And a lot of Canada, the States, I'm not, a, again, if the Lord has prospered a ministry to communicate the gospel in different countries. Praise God for that. Okay, when COVID lifts, eventually hope in India will have one in India. Okay, I'm not putting down that. But listen to this. My office in Cannes, just now for the film festival. Lovely time with Leo DiCaprio and Carrie Mulligan. A couple of nights ago at the premiere of Gatsby and Justin Timberlake and Emma Watson, amongst others tonight. Looking forward to the premiere of the new print of The Last Emperor in 3D tomorrow night. We'll be joining the fabulous actress, Caroline Goodall. I just hope the weather improves soon. There have been a few downpours. Steven Spielberg is here for two weeks as president of the jury, and I'm going to suggest he visits Scotland. Now, does this sound like a film industry wannabe trying to impress people? A small time person in the film industry trying to impress people? That they're rubbing shoulders with DiCaprio or Emma Watson or, or Spielberg, whatever. Now I have a friend who actually witnessed the Spielberg in California, a Jewish guy, but he doesn't make a lot of publicity out of it. Anyway, he just, Boasting about hanging out and rubbing elbows with movie stars. Now, I'm sure this is exaggerated, and I'm sure this person has, has an office in cons the way I have a gingerbread castle in Kathmandu, but that's what the, <laughs> my office in cons just now for the film, lovely time with, with DiCaprio and Justin Timberlake and Emma Watson and the, Spielberg. That's the way the people in the world talk, don't they? Who are trying to impress people. That's people who are driven by pride, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life. Well, it's not what she looks like. She used a film of herself when she was younger. Deborah Menlos, Studio Scotland. That's what she sends out. That's what she says is her ministry. Well, Studio Scotland made a, the films I was in, the Daniel Connection, the Daniel Project. I narrated it. But look what, just the world. Nothing but the world. The pride, the lust, the eyes. It's just the world. Not a word about Jesus. Not a word about the, not a syllable about the gospel. Not a syllable. They don't mention his name. Oh, they mention Spielberg and Emma Watson and DiCaprio. They won't mention Jesus. Now, if it was a secular film business, I wouldn't care. But it's a commercially registered company that represents itself to Christians as a ministry. She actually claims it's a ministry. DiCaprio, Spielberg, Watson, Timberlake, Goodall, where's Jesus Christ? This is terrible. This is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the world, the boastful pride of life. I wouldn't care if it was just pure Hollywood, but don't tell me it's a ministry. 
That's not a ministry. It's what John warns about. There's an unclean spirit on back of that kind of stuff that's setting Christians up. Look at what it did with Jim and Tammy Baker. Look at what it did with Wendy and Rory Alec. Look what it did with Paul and Jan Crouch. It always ends in a scandal that disgraces the name of Christ publicly and that Satan anoints to damage the witness and credibility of the church. But it has another purpose. It seduces Christians. They begin to see the Mercedes limo or the Lincoln Continental stretch limo and the private jet. They begin to see this kind of thing as some kind of evidence of, of, of God's anointing or God's hand on them. No, no, it's not. Children, it's the last hour. The Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. Now again, I've read this in Greek, and I know I've explained this before. The term last there would be better translated latter, the former as opposed to the latter. Look with me, if you don't know already, I know many of you do, the Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, the Pedic Ashabuah and the liturgical reading in the synagogue and the temple, in these last days is eschatos, not last as in final, but last as in latter. The former days are the old covenant, the latter days are the new. When the scripture speaks of the return of Christ and the events leading up to it, the term is not eschato, it's not eschatology. Theologians misapplied that term to mean about the return of Christ. No, the return of Christ is called the close of the age. What will be the sign of your coming and the close of the present age, which relates to the time of the Gentiles, okay, and the age of the age of the church and the times of the Gentiles. Again, whole subject in itself. We've addressed it before, and we have other teachings talking about it. Okay. But it says last hour. And I've often used the analogy of the clock stopping at a sports event. Five minutes left in the game, there's a serious injury, the clock is stopped until the paramedics can get out there to get an ambulance to remove the injured player, they show a commercial, <laughs> and then the clock begins again. There's always five minutes left in the game. Time freezes. This freezing of time this last hour is again the time between the 69th and 70th week of Daniel's vision in Daniel chapter 9. It is during that gap, during that hiatus, when the age of the church takes place and when most of the times of the Gentiles, which overlaps with it, takes place. Strictly speaking, the times of the Gentiles don't end until the control of the Temple Mount is in the hands of Israel and handed over to Antichrist. That's something that relates, but I only mention it briefly. Okay. It's the last hour. Time has frozen. There's always five minutes left in the game. Okay. Well, when you see Israel being regathered as a nation, when you see Israel back in its capital, Jerusalem, and when you see Jews beginning to believe in Jesus again, you know the clock is going to begin ticking again soon. Okay? Well, that's the state of world affairs now. That's where we are. The clock is going to begin. It's the last hour the Antichrist is coming. 
However, or that anti, even now many antichrists, even in the first century, there were antichrists. Even in the first century, there were people who put themselves in the place of Christ. They were the pagan emperors. They were false religious leaders. They've existed throughout the centuries. We deal with this in depth in the book I authored called Shadows of the Beast. And we look at all of the historical and scriptural types or most of the scriptural types of the Antichrist. And we look at how they foreshadow, prefigure the ultimate man of lawlessness who comes into play in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and in Revelation 13 and so forth in league with the false prophet. All the other ones are types or shadows of him. He's going to replay what they did. Again, the book is Shadows of the Beast, available Amazon, Moriel, whatever, should you be so inclined. We also have recorded teachings of it available for free download. Even now, many. For this, we know it's the last hour. Now, look at this. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. If they'd been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they are not really of us. Remember, the Antichrist is son of perdition, Judas is son of perdition. John acutely explains Antichrist in the character of the son of perdition. The turncoat among us, the traitor among us. He was not really of us, but he sure did look like it. And he went out from among us the way Judas left the Last Supper. Again, I point you to the book. But then he talks about something else. The real anointing. The Cristo. Now, again, the name Christ comes from the same root in Greek, Hebrew, or, or the Septuagint's translation of the Hebrew, Moshiach, Meshach, and to anoint. Okay. You have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know there is a real anointing. But the people who run around talking about anointing the most, the word of faith, money preachers, and people like that, are usually are, are, are the ones who don't have it. <laughs> Jesus was anointed for burial before he was anointed for dominion. <laughs> I've not written you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it. And no lie is of the truth. The Holy Spirit did not inspire John to write this in order to tell us the truth. He inspired John to write this to the first century church and to you and I because we already know the truth. Those who understand that world events are coming to their penultimate climax, that Antichrist is coming, that the faithful church is going to have to identify him, and Satan is doing everything he can to confuse Christians away from this. Again, I look at people like Chris Rosebro in the United States. There's no Antichrist, there's no falling away, there's no mark of the beast. This is what that deceiver teaches. That's what he teaches. He mocks people who believe it. This is Chris Rosebro. He's tied in with the Studio Scotland men laws crowd. And he mocks it. He says, no, there's no, there's no antichrist. There's not going to be a falling away. There's not going to be a number of the beast. This is the working of Satan trying to delude Christians. They don't know the truth. People who believe that are not in the truth. Then we have the purpose-driven agenda. Rick Warren says, avoid this stuff. Avoid the subject of end-time prophecy. Avoid it. It's a diversion, says Mr. Warren. Well, we've warned about this a number of times. Christians who believe the purpose-driven lie are not in the truth. 
This is not for them. They will never understand it. They're not in the truth. They're not in the truth. This is only written for those who know the truth. It's the Holy Spirit showing you that what's happening in the world in contemporary events are of prophetic significance. It's the Holy Spirit showing you Jesus is coming and these events are getting ready for the Antichrist to come. Well, you know the truth. This is for you. It's not for them. It's not for the apostate church. Those people who believe this stuff, they're going to be the apostate church. They're going to go into apostasy. They're not going to be ready. This is for those who are in the truth, who know the truth. Then it becomes very, very pointed. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father, and the one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will abide in the Son and in the Father. We cannot overamplify the importance of what he's saying here. For us, for the faithful church. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Messiah? John is a Jew writing to other Jews and to non-Jews who believed. He is stating rabbinic Judaism, which would later evolve into Talmudic Judaism. Rabbinism. Denies that Jesus is the Messiah. That's why they're going to follow the Antichrist. When he sets the image up in the temple, they deny the true Messiah, they will follow a false one. Jesus alludes to this in John chapter 5. Another comes in his own name, and you believe. This is Antichrist. Back of this stuff. There's an antichrist spirit, particularly in back of mystical Judaism and Kabbalah and things like this. Let's move on. Islam takes the prophecies in the Old Testament that are about Jesus and says, no, they're about Muhammad. A lot of Christians don't realize that that's what Islam does. It says the Quran is the third testament. No, Jesus is only a prophet inferior to Muhammad. Muhammad is the anointed one. He's the greatest prophet. Denies the father-son relationship. The Quran says, Allah is not begotten, neither does he beget. God has no son. I'm not joking. Some of you know this. If you've been to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, you've seen those two naturally occurring demonic figures in the marble paneling on the south side of the Mosque of Omar, directly underneath the inscription in Arabic, God has no son. Islam is an anti-Christ religion. These people talking about Quislam and looking for common ground with them. There's no common ground. Denies the Father and the Son. Denies it. That which denies the Father-Son relationship. Many heretical expressions of Christianity deny the literal sonship of Jesus in the sense of monogenes. They say he was God's son and that he was a unique man and he became a son of God 
metaphorically. No, no, no. He was the eternal son of God, pre-existent in Proverbs 8, John chapter 1. Be careful. We have to understand that which denies the father-son relationship. Liberal Protestantism, okay? Rabbinism, that is Talmudic Judaism as opposed to Levitical Judaism. Levitical Judaism is legitimate. It's fulfilled in Christ. What Moses taught is, of course, legitimate. Then Islam. All of these things deny the father-son relationship. If you don't have the son, you don't have the father. I was so frightened when someone who had worked with our ministry, who we got rid of, David Nathan, again, he was promoted by Studio Scotland, was saying that God the Father is not the creator. <laughs> the world was made through him. The father was the creator. The father-son relationship. Whenever you see that father-son relationship, being challenged or attacked or undermined. That is an antichrist spirit. It's an antichrist spirit. There's an unclean spirit on back of it. Now look what it says. You heard from the beginning. If he abides in you, you will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. Chai Netzach, eternal life. To live eternally is God's promise. If a Christian is about to give up the ghost... <laughs> They know they have a God who cannot lie. They know they have a God who has promised. God never breaks his promises. Unfortunately, we often break ours, the ones we made to him. He never breaks his promises. You see a believer, and the hourglass is almost empty, and they're going to check out. Or if we're here when the Lord comes, we can hold ourselves assured based on the promise of a God who cannot lie. He promised us eternal life. God's own personal promise. It's to all of us corporately in Christ, but it's to each one of us individually. God promised even me eternal life. God promised you eternal life. He promised you personally, as well as us corporately. As long as we are in Christ, we are promised eternal life. Well, let's look. Now, he tells us something. Remember, he's only writing to the people who know the truth. These things I've written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing which you received from him abides in you. You have no one, <clears throat> or no need for anyone to teach you. We already know the truth. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true, it's not a lie, and just as it has taught you, abide in him. He's writing these things to us who know the truth because we are going to be the targets of deceivers. He tells us this, I'm writing these things to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. Right now, there are people who Satan has raised up 
who claim to have an anointing from the Lord, but it's not real. And they're trying to deceive us. Ultimately, you'll see that they love the world and the things of the world. <laughs> and they get into false Christology, false doctrines about the relationship of Jesus and his Father. You want to know what God the Father is like? Look at Jesus. What is God like? Look at Jesus. The fullness of the Father dwells in him bodily. He's the exact image, the mirror image of God in human form. What is God like? Look at Jesus. That's what God is like. Show us the Father. You see me, you've seen him. Anything that attacks that hypostatic relationship between the Father and the Son, look out. He goes on. These people who are trying to deceive us are going to try to attack us in the areas of loving the world, in the areas of false anointing, and in the areas of false Christology. That's what they will do. He goes on. As for you, the anointing which you've received in verse 27, no need for anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you, is true, not a lie, just as it is taught you, abide in him. Now, little children, now abide in him so that when he appears, the parousia, he's coming, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. If you're born again, you practice righteousness. You do not live immorally. Those people who do not know this, if they are here when he appears, they will shrink back from him even if they profess to be somehow Christians. You know some of the predictions in Revelation and in the Old Testament. They will say to the rocks, fall on us, hide us from him. <laughs> well, think about it. There's either going to be an enthusiastic running towards him, an enthusiastic running towards him, or an ignominious shrinking back away from him. Now, in our first two lessons, we looked at the idea of the righteousness. It is not talking about sinless perfection yet. But when he comes, there will be a sinless perfection. It is those who picked up the cross and battled the old nature, who do not live in sin, even though they may make mistakes. They do make mistakes. They falter, but they still trust him and continue. That battle we have of clinging to the old rugged cross comes to an end. When the parousia takes place and Jesus returns, the old rugged cross will have fulfilled its use. We exchange it for a crown. The deceivers who John is warning about say that Jesus died for our sins and that's all there is to it. The cross is finished. It's the completed work. Well, it's the completed work of Christ. It's not the completed work of us. Again, I refer to what we talked about at the beginning. Certainly the hyper-grace teachings of Joseph Prince, the licentiousness, being one example. Certainly the blab it and grab it, name it and claim it crowd being another. Jesus died so you'd have this and have this. Now that's true. 
We will get those things in the millennium and in eternity. We will get those things. But the cross is something that continues. Yes, Jesus died on it. Right now, we are dying on it. God is using it to get rid of our old nature. Every one of us has a cross. There is no believer who does not have something in their life that they struggle with. Whatever thorn you have in the flesh, whatever burden it is, the thing that is the pebble in your boot that doesn't seem to go away, God may give you the grace and will give you the grace to cope with it. He'll give you the grace to deal with it. But he hasn't taken it away, has he? Oh, he will take it away. He will take it away. You can throw the thing away once and for all and exchange it for a crown when Jesus comes. In the meantime, of course, no cross, no crown. I don't have to tell you not to believe the word faith money preaches. I don't have to tell you to not believe the purpose-driven lie. I don't have to tell you not to buy into hyper grace. I don't have to tell you to keep away from people like men laws. I don't have to tell you things. I don't have to tell you. You already know that. You already know that. No, you know these things. But when he comes, when he comes, those who've carried the cross can drop it and run towards him. Those who have not carried the cross will find it's too late to pick it up and run from him. When he appears, we are to have confidence and not shame. The goal every one of us should have now is to be like Paul. I've run the good race. I have fought the good fight. I know that hence is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. He was ready to check out. He actually said to live as Christ, to die as gain. It's better to get out of here. I'm only here for your sake. Now remember something about Paul, why God used him to tell us that. Paul, like the Apostle John in Revelation, but we're talking about Paul, went to heaven and came back down. He saw what was up there. He saw the great beyond, the afterlife. What no eye hath seen or ear hath heard of, God prepared for those who loved him. He saw it. He was talking about what he knew. He went, he saw it, and came back, and he told us, now John is doing the same thing. It's not what they do not know. They've experienced it as people. Well, that's quite an encouragement, isn't it? Is there any other religion in the world that has had people come back from the dead and tell us what it's like and tell us how to prepare for it? Is there any other religion that has a Paul or an Apostle John or above all a Jesus Christ? <laughs> is there anyone that's been there and come back and told us what it is and how to get ready for it? No. No, it is only the gospel of Jesus Christ that can do that. Nominal Christianity cannot do that. Obviously, Islam cannot do that. Eastern religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, Taoism, they cannot do that. None of them can do that. But the New Testament can. 
Just think about that. People who've left and come back to tell us what it's like. That includes Jesus himself, first and foremostly. But not only Jesus. John? Paul? In some way, Elijah's coming back, it would seem. The people who've been there tell us something. Forget about this place. <laughs> don't trust it. It's hopeless. It's, it's all a lie. Just don't, don't buy into it. Don't buy into the world and its lusts. Just don't buy into it. I've been to the other side of the great divide. I've entered eternity. I know the reality. I've seen it. Don't buy into this con job. That's all the world is, is a big con job. That's all it is. It could be Hollywood celebrities dripping with jewels and furs. It's a con job. That's nothing like what we're going to get. Nothing. Just a con. To get them to trust in this place instead of in the real place. If you know he's righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Then he goes into speaking of the Father's love. Chapter 3 speaks of the Father's love. We're looking now, though, at the return of Christ from the point of view of John 2. False anointings, false doctrines of Christ in his relationship with his father, and false hopes stirred up by the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. Those are the things we need to watch out for. Now, this idea of a different Christ is a big deal. It is a big deal. And there's many false Christs. And there are many antichrists. The Pope is an antichrist. Jesus says, call no man your father. The Pope calls himself the Holy Father. Jesus says, it is the Holy Spirit who acts vicariously on his behalf in his absence into the parousia. The Holy Spirit acts on behalf of Jesus. He is the vicar of Christ. Well, the Pope says he's the vicar. That's an antichrist. Joseph Smith of the Mormons, Muhammad, Sun Young Moon, all these people are antichrist. All of them. And the closer we get to the return of Jesus, there will be more still. Now, you already know this, but because you already know it, John writes this to us. Look, you got the truth. You got, you understand, you've got the, I can't talk to those other ones. They don't have the truth. Even if they claim to be Christians, they're not in the truth. I'm talking to you because you know the truth. If you didn't know the truth, I wouldn't be writing this to you. I wouldn't be talking to you. I'd be wasting my time, my ink. Watch out for these deceivers who try to get you into love in the world, the lust of the world, the boastful pride of life. Watch out for those people. Watch out for people who have false Christologies, false doctrines of Jesus. Whenever you see somebody with a false Christology, a false doctrine of Jesus, they have a false doctrine of the Father. If you have a true doctrine of Jesus, you will automatically have a true theology, a true doctrine of the Father. If you have a wrong doctrine of Jesus, you will automatically have a wrong doctrine of the Father. You've heard me say it till I'm blue in the face. He dies once and for all for sin. We're told that repeatedly by Peter and in Hebrews. 
Oh no, he has to die again and again and again sacramentally. Huh? That's a false doctrine of Christ. The father accepted his perfect sacrifice one time. He said, I'm not coming back except the way I left. Oh no, he comes back in the mass. Whenever you see people having a false doctrine of Jesus, their doctrine of the Father is wrong. The Jehovah's Witnesses are basically Arians. The Mormons, Latter-day Saints, Jesus is the spirit brother of Satan. <clears throat> Islam, of course. Allah is the Nabataean moon god. God has no son. Yes, he does. <clears throat> Therefore, your God is not the real God. It's the Nabataean moon god. It's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the father of Jesus. If the doctrine of Jesus is right, if the Christology is right, the doctrine of the father is right. If the doctrine of Jesus is wrong, the doctrine of the father is wrong. God the father is not the creator. Again, again, not the harp on that. That was David Nathan's teaching. <clears throat> And GV 24-7, the men laws promoted that for a year. They promoted him for a full year, knowing he was a heretic. These are the deceivers we're warned about. This is exactly what we're warned. If the doctrine of Jesus is wrong, the doctrine of the Father is wrong. No other possibility, no exception. Next characteristic will be a wrong anointing, but a wrong concept of anointing. If you have the real anointing of the Lord, if you have the real anointing, you're going to be in the truth. People who are in fundamentally false doctrine are not in the true anointing of the anointed one. If you are not in doctrinal truth, you are not and cannot be in the anointing of the anointed one. He's talking to us because we know the truth. The Lord is coming. Satan knows it. There are many deceivers on the loose, just as we were warned. And their numbers are not going to decrease. If anything, their numbers will increase. These are the painful realities. These other people won't have a chance. Thank God. John writes these things to us. Just by virtue of the fact that you know the truth about Jesus, just by virtue of the fact you know the truth about salvation, just by virtue of the fact that we know the truth about eternity, just that means God gives us a promise. He gives us a promise. If you don't have those things, the promise does not apply to you. Lord have mercy, but it applies to you now. John says, I'm writing this so you will not be deceived by anybody. Don't worry. If you don't want to be deceived, you won't be. False anointings the lust of the world, false doctrines of Christ. It'll come near you, but it won't touch you. That's the way it is. Love not the world. What is the first thing the Lord tells saved Christians about the coming Antichrist? Is it to understand the number of the beast? That's vitally important, but that's not the first thing he says. 
is it to understand what's happening in Israel with the temple and the image, image of the beast. That's vitally important, but that's not the first thing he says. Unless we understand the first thing he says, forget about counting the number of his name. Forget about recognizing the abomination. Forget about all the rest of the prophecies. Forget about it. It doesn't apply to you. You can't handle it. Those things that are vital and essential are only going to be for those who are in the truth. The first thing he tells us is, and yeah, it's going to be deceivers, false anointings, false doctrines of Christ. But the first thing, the first thing the Lord is saying to you in these days in which we live, the first thing the Lord is saying to me is love not the world. Thank you so much for listening. Sandy? Thank you so much, Jacob. Really appreciate that. Uh, wise words from John. Um, let's see. Uh, Joseph Franklin, do you want to ask him a question? You can unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Where are you, Joseph? Hey, you how you doing, uh, Jacob? God bless you, by the God way. Bless you. Where are you located, Joseph? Oh, <laughs> Originally, I'm from uh, Apple Valley, Southern California. Okay. Uh, I, I ended up <laughs> here in Homa, Louisiana. You're in Louisiana. Uh, okay. It's it's the way, way down dirty south. So In the bayous? Oh, yeah. I, I'm uh, 15 minutes from the Gulf. Oh, boy, I don't want the gators get you. Oh, oh yeah. They're going to be coming out uh, soon, yeah. actually. Yeah. <laughs> Um, do you speak Cajun? Oh, no, I've been here for two years. <laughs> okay. Uh, just it, it, it's part of my testimony the way I, I became a believer two years ago after being raised in the church, being raised by a very brilliant family in, um, in theology. My dad speaks Greek and Hebrews, anyways. Uh, so I finally became a believer after two years, and my life has just Praise been incredible. God. What's yeah. your question, Joseph? You know, it's a, yeah. So, uh, I, I mean, what I've come out of is, see, I, I was never exposed to thinking and being prepared for the, the end times because, we, I was not raised to touch on that. It was kind of mystified, like, oh, well, we'll stay away from Revelation. And uh, because I never heard the gospel at all. I mean, goodness, 35 years in the church, never heard it. Were you Lutheran? Uh, no, Methodist. Oh, boy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyways, my... Thank you for list, uh, allowing me to share that. So um, now, how do we, I mean, the, the world is so fallen. How do we as believers, um, knowing that we know that people are believing in a false Christology, first yes. off, and they're so deeply rooted in it that, um, you know, sharing the gospel or even having a rational discussion with them about yep. more things is impossible. That's right. They're not in the truth. So I, so I want to say a question, but it's also really encouraging to hear that because that was my prayer today that man, this, this world can't, I, I feel like I'm all alone. I, nobody's hearing me, you know? So, yeah. uh, yeah. <laughs> well, if you can join us on RTN on Saturday night, it'll be, oh, let's see, Louisiana time. You're in central time, aren't you? So, right. so it'll be five o'clock on uh, next Saturday. Uh, if you can join us on RTN, 
and uh, it'll be uh, live streamed on Amoriel, I think. Oh, yeah, uh, definitely. We're, we're going to be talking about your situation. Oh, the, wow. Okay. You feel isolated and so on. We'll be speaking from First Kings 19, looking at the situation you described. So my, my best answer would be, if you're able to, join us on Saturday. Definitely. Okay. Thank you, Jacob. All right. Thanks okay. for the time. God Thank bless. you, Joseph. Appreciate that. A um, couple other questions from people. Um, Michael asks, when John uses the phrase, it is the last hour, what did he mean? Was he looking toward the 70th week of Daniel? Yes. I tried to explain that. Yes. The last hour, time freezes. Time, as, as the word goes sideways. The way I explain it is a rugby game or a football game. Uh, when a player is injured, when there's five minutes left in the game and the referee stops the clock, well, that's where we are. The clock begins ticking again. That is the last seven years, okay? That is the last seven years. We're right at that time in, in Daniel chapter 9 between the 69th and 70th week. It's been the last hour since the since the since 2,000 years ago, but the clock is getting ready to tick again uh, because Israel's back as a nation and so forth, okay? Um, Betsy, along with that, she asks, are we in the time of sorrows? We're coming up to the time of what's known as the beginning of birth pangs, the beginning of birth pangs. We are not there yet. Yeah. Um, Leanne asks, uh, large vineyard churches here, well, she's, this is some information. Large uh, vineyard churches here in Los Angeles area are holding monthly dinners with Muslims to build relationships and letting the Muslims speak at the dinners to so Christians can understand Islam better. <laughs> what do you expect from the vineyard movement? Yeah. It's the legacy of John Wimber. What do you expect? Yeah. It's, that's bad. Um, the Muslims see it's Allah bringing them the infidel to be converted to Islam. That's how they look at it. Yeah. You know, if you want to understand Muslims... All you have to do in the age we live is go on YouTube and listen to the testimony of people who were saved out of it. Listen to the testimonies of ex-Muslims who've come to faith in Jesus. They will tell you everything you need to know. I don't need to go to somebody in a, in, in a false religion to tell me or to teach me anything. I want to know from people saved out of it. The best people to tell you about Roman Catholicism are ex-Catholics, particularly ex-Roman Catholic clergy. The best people to tell you about Jehovah's Witnesses are ex-JWs. The best people to tell you about Mormonism are ex-Mormons saved out of it. And the best people to tell you about Islam are Muslims who come to faith in Christ. The best people to tell you about Orthodox Judaism are people who were saved out of it. Don't listen to the Vineyard Movement. It comes from, from, from John Wimber. That whole Chuck Smith knew Wimber went off way back. Yes. Chuck Smith was right. That's right. Okay, another question from Mary. She asks, could you explain more what verse 27 means when it says you have no need for anyone to teach you as we obviously benefit from Bible study? I, your transmission was interrupted. Could you re oh, Sorry, uh, She says, can you explain verse 27 when it says you have no need for yes. anyone to teach you because we obviously benefit from Bible study? Okay. What he's saying is this. Uh, as for you, the anointing which you've received from him abides in you and you have no one, no need for anyone to teach you. You have no one, no need for anyone to teach you about that subject, mm -hmm. about the anointing. It doesn't say you don't have anyone that God's going to use to teach you doctrine or other things. It's focused on the context. 
you don't have anyone, a need for anyone to teach you about being in the anointing of, of the anointed one, Jesus. If you're in Christ, you have no need for someone to teach you about that, about what it's talking about, being, being in the anointing of the anointed one. It's not saying you have no one, no need for anyone to teach you full stop, period. It right. doesn't, exactly. I think that clarifies, okay. Um, Tracy asks, since we all feel so isolated, do you think the restrainer uh, has stopped restraining or very close? I think it's getting closer, yes. Or I think it stopped completely, not yet, but it's getting there. Yeah. Uh, I'll just ask this. Who is the restrainer? <laughs> the catacomb in Greek, the catacomb is the Holy Spirit. Right. Um, let's see. By the way, I'll just throw this out. We've explained this in other teachings. That doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is taken or that the church is raptured. The right. only thing it means in 2 Thessalonians 2 is that the one who restrains stops restraining. Yes. The Holy Spirit does not leave the, the hearts of faithful believers. He just stops convicting the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. But he doesn't leave. He just stops restraining. Okay. Right. Michael's asking, is the anointing the same as being born again? Or, in other words, indwelled by the Holy Spirit? Uh. One is a function of the other. One is a function of the other. Jesus is the anointed one, okay? When you come to a faith in Christ through second birth, you come into that anointing. You come under his headship. Um, very briefly, again, it's... it's I don't want to become diverted or digress too much. Look with me to, to Psalm 131, please. Sorry, Psalm 133, 133. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Now, it begins with unity. Now look at verse 2. It's like the precious oil. The Hebrew word for anointing comes from oil, mishcha, to anoint. Not shemen oil, but anointing oil. Mishcha, Jesus is Moshiach. We get the word Messiah. In Greek, Christon. But in Hebrew, Mashiach, Mishcha, anoint, uh, ointment. Okay. It's like the precious oil, which is a figure of the Holy Spirit, obviously, coming down upon the head, down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robes. We are told in Hebrews the Aaronic high priest is a picture of Christ. He's our high priest. Okay. In other words, to come under the anointing of Christ, you must be under his headship, okay? The oil is poured on him on the day of Pentecost. It was poured out on him. God has made him Messiah, it says in Acts 2 in Peter's Kerygma. To have the anointing, you must be attached to the body and under the headship of Christ. He's the anointed one. Our anointing comes from being under the anointed one. The oil is on his head. It comes down off of his head, down his beard, onto the rest of the body. Okay? Notice it never touches the flesh, except for his. Another subject. I hope that explains it. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. Um, an interesting question. Um, John warned about Antichrist coming in verse 18. Is it fair to conclude John was anticipating the body of Christ meeting Antichrist rather than being raptured and not meeting, not knowing who he was? John, like Paul, was emphatic. There is a need to be able to identify an Antichrist, and there will be a need to identify the Antichrist. 
with all due respect to our brethren, some of whom are my friends who are into the pre-tribulational error, it is an error. Yes. Um, along with the anointing, I have a question because I touched on this in my last study. Uh, you uh, spoke to this in your uh, old article called Three Years and Still No Revival. Right. You're talking about the uh, transferable anointing. You're, you're going back in time now, but go ahead. Yeah, sorry about that. And the fact that um, that's really disallowed back in Exodus 30. Uh, yes, it's an abomination to transfer an anointing. Yes. That, that's, that was really powerful. It's been an abomination to try to transfer an anointing. It's not ours to give. Right. God can't make, you know, only God can make somebody an evangelist or a pastor or a prophet. <laughs> right. Or a teacher. Only God can anoint you for that ministry. And that was, that's what I was talking about. Is that You see people right. trying to anoint other people to be right. something. That is antichrist in itself. They're right. putting themselves in place of Christ. Only right. he can anoint them. Amen. In Acts 13, Acts 13, when they laid hands on Barnabas and Paul, and Saul, as it's called there, notice it says, the Holy Spirit told them to do it. <laughs> right. We can't do it. It's in The those... church can only confirm an anointing. The yeah. church cannot confer an anointing. Right. In those passages, it's always at or through. That's correct. Of hands. It's not by the laying on of hands. That's right. The will of man. That's correct. Only God can ordain a minister. Right. The Lord's right. ministers are the ministers of the Lord. They are not the ministers of the church. Amen. Um, Andrew, did you have a question? Uh, I had a question. I think, uh, thank you so much for the preaching today, Brother Jacob. God bless uh, you. Very, very edifying as always. I had a question with regards to what you mentioned earlier about uh, the people that are, the epistle being brought to the church, obviously, that knows the truth and abides in truth. And uh, I think you mentioned at some point that the people that are, are millennial, the likes of uh, uh, Chris Roseborough and the people in the reformed camp. Uh, he's, he's not reformed. He's worse than that. He's catechetical Lutheran. Oh, so I, 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 he believes I that he believes that forgiveness of sins comes by confessing your sin to him. That he has oh. a vow to God that it, that empowers him to forgive sins in the name of Jesus. Catechetical Lutherans like Roseboro are a mixture of Protestant and Roman Catholic. They're fifty-fifty. They theologically, doctrinally, they're half Catholic and half Protestant. That's what Roseboro is. He's he's worse than reformed. Yeah, and I I think uh, to actually it's not a surprise because when I when I was in a reformed Baptist church, I used to tell them warnings about uh, the the falling away from the many of yeah. the, in within the circle, and they used to say, well, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, there's nothing wrong with these brethren. They may just be. They used to, in other words, undermine that. <laughs> So it's no surprise. Yeah, well, you see, if you believe in unconditional, once saved, always saved, which Reformed Baptists do, they don't worry about it falling away because they don't think it's possible for it to happen, even though the yeah. scriptures say it can. Yeah. They, have a, they have a reductio ad absurdum. Uh, you know, the, the, we don't have to worry about it falling away because it can't happen. That's what they basically think. Quite interesting. Uh, and and I think uh, the other thing was, uh, I mean, the people obviously, uh, let's say people like the Neo Galatians and Seventh Day Adventism and yes. many, many others. So would you say? I mean, I'm trying to reach out to some friends who they they claim to believe the gospel, but sadly they still hold to the teachings of Ellen G. White. And I'm trying to reach out. Yeah. To them. Well, that's not our subject tonight, and I couldn't really divert into into that. Yes, but I think what, there are what some was... excellent there are some excellent articles on the internet written by people who've come out of Seventh Day Adventism. Yeah, Moriel in near Loma Linda, California, near Redlands, which is the epicenter of Seventh Day Adventism in the United States, is where the university is, and so forth. We have a number of people who've come out of it, um, but it's a big, big subject. Uh, it's I couldn't really. 
I don't want to open that can of worms now because it would be a total diversion away from tonight's subject. But I would point you to some material on the internet concerning it. Sandy, you want to add to that? No, you, you actually have a good article on Moriel as well uh, about that. Uh, you know, uh, oh, remind, remind me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you know, it'll. I, I, it's actually coming out, or it already came out in the Be Alert. So if you're if you're signed up for Be Alert, then you'll get it. I have one other observation and question. Uh, I was talking to a pastor friend of mine, and so many churches have basically they're almost missing like half of their people because of COVID. Yes, they're staying home. And his, he had an interesting take on it. He says he wonders if a lot of it is because of this uh, once saved, always saved teaching. People feel like they're going to be okay. They don't really need to go back to church. You know, forsake not the fellowshipping together one with another, especially as you see the day approaching. Amen. Hebrews 10.25. And that's, fo that's followed by a big warning, a caveat of falling away. Yeah. Yeah. It's you know, when you believe of when somebody believes one false doctrine, it automatically predisposes them to believe other false doctrines. Okay. Yes. Yes, it sure does. 